Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. This is the, I believe the second event in our EPP Spring Speaker Series, um, which is part of the first ever Indigenous Environmental Planning um, course that's being offered at DUSP. Um, if you could please just mute yourself. I think maybe we have, yeah, thank you. Um, Great, and so our, our guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Jaskaran Dillon, who is an associate professor of global studies at the New School. And I'll let Larry, one of the faculty teaching this course, give her a more full introduction, but um, she'll be delivering a talk today called Anti-Colonial Critiques and Coalitions in Environmental Justice. Um, for people who are just joining, we are recording the session and we'll be posting it afterwards on, on the DUSP YouTube page. Um, just, I wanted to give just a quick intro to this course. So um, we're meeting every Thursday. Uh, we have a great student mix of graduate and undergraduates and um, the uh, instructors who are all on today are Larry Suskind, um, Janelle Knox-Hayes from both from DUSP and then um, Dr. Elizabeth Rule from George Washington University um, who is also our, our um, co-instructor. Um, this is our statement about the course and the purposes of the course. Um, we, I just wanted to call out the structure of the course. So we have these seminars and conversations with guest speakers. And um, a lot of the work of the course has been students working on client projects with um, two MIT Solved Indigenous Communities Fellows, Dr. Koop Kahakalau and Ipadon Burke. Um, as well as Leslie Jonas from the Native Land Conservancy. Um, and so they're midway through their projects at this point in the semester um, and uh, have had their thoughts seeded by all our great guest speakers like Dr. Dillon. Um, and finally, I'll just offer a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> the teaching team acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land which MIT occupies is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation and Massachusetts peoples. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of these territories, as well as the ongoing processes of colonialism and dispossession in which we and our institution are implicated. Beyond the stolen territory, which we physically occupy, MIT has long profited from the sale of federal lands granted by the Morrill Act, territories stolen from 82 tribes, including the Greater and Little Osage, Chippewa and Omaha peoples. As we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land from time immemorial, we seek to indigenize our institution in the field of planning, offer space and leave indigenous peoples in more empowered positions. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing screen and um, turn it over to Larry to, to do a, a little bit more background on Dr. Dillon. Uh, first, uh, welcome again. Uh, Dr. Dillon, we oh, we can't function in this course given what you see as our aspirations without assistance from you and others. And uh, for all of us, <clears throat> the faculty as well as students, um, we are grateful that you could take some time and be with us. Uh, for everyone who's here uh, to listen in today, I'm going to read a, a short bit uh, from Dr. Dillon's uh, bio because I want to get the titles of uh, her books right uh, because I know some of you are going to want to follow up. Um, uh, uh, Jessica and Dylan is an anti-colonial scholar and organizer who grew up on Treaty 6 <clears throat> Cree territory in Saskatchewan. Uh, her work spans the fields of settler colonialism, anthropology of the state, environmental justice, anti-racist feminism, colonial violence, political ecology, and youth studies. Her writing's been published in The Guardian, The Nation, Cultural Anthropology, Feminist Formations, Environment and Society, Social Texts and Decolonization, amongst other venues. She is the author of Prairie Rising, Indigenous Youth, Decolonization, and the Politics of Intervention, which was published in 2017, and co-editor of Standing with Standing Rock, a voices from the, um, I'm not sure the right way to say this, except 
to say no DAPL movement 2019. You can t say more about that if you want, um, Jaskirin, uh, so people know what the real reference is to. Uh, Jaskirin is an associate professor of global studies and anthropology, truly and fully interdisciplinary in her thinking and her work at the New School and president of the New School's AAUP chapter. Again, we are delighted to have you with us and we look forward to having both a chance to hear what you have to say and then to ask some questions. Please go right ahead. Um, welcome everyone and thanks so much for being here. Um, I know it's an early morning and end of semester, so busy time. So I appreciate you all um, taking the time to join us today. Um, and I'd like to thank um, the um, professors who are teaching this class for inviting me to speak to all of you today. Um, I'm really impressed with the, the sort of layout of your curriculum. And I think I'm hoping that what I have to offer today offers some important insight and um, maybe some additional things to think about as you're sort of going about the work of, of crafting your class um, for future academic semesters. Um, so I'd like to begin today by centering land restitution, territorial defense, and the social movements of indigenous peoples worldwide, and to note that we are gathered wherever we are on the ancestral homelands of many native nations. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Philadelphia, Lenape territory. Land acknowledgements are, however, at best, a beginning point from which to begin deeper conversations about what it means to decolonize the academy. That is to say, land acknowledgements must go alongside a commitment to honoring and supporting Indigenous movements for self-determination, led by Indigenous stewards and protectors of the land and water that we share. This responsibility includes engaging with, questioning, and critiquing those practices and structures within and outside the university that reproduce and sustain colonial relations of power and domination in the everyday. So just a, a follow-up to your land acknowledgement as well. I'm gonna spend a few minutes now explaining the format for my presentation. I've divided my talk into three sections. The first section provides a bit of a window into how I think about myself as a scholar and educator. Given the multiple forms of colonial violence enacted against communities in the academy, socially locating oneself is a necessary starting point. The next section attends to my current scholarly research and community organizing, which critically engages the politics of environmental justice and more specifically gestures towards the limitations of this movement when we consider histories of settler colonialism, indigenous dispossession, and the long arc of resistance that characterizes indigenous life, history, and politics on Turtle Island. I share reflections here about Standing Rock and the No Dapple movement, and my more recent work on Wet'suwet'en territory in Northern British Columbia. I close with a discussion of where I'm heading with this research on a global level, situating this work within a larger discussion about global indigenous politics and coalitions, and hopefully leaving you with a strong sense of why this kind of situated, multi-sided and internationalist approach to ethnography and understanding issues of environmental justice as they relate to indigenous politics and history matter so much in this historical moment. So just a bit about who I am and where I come from. So, um, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I'm, I grew up on Treaty 6 Cree territory, so I'm the daughter of immigrant parents um, who immigrated to Canada in the 1960s, and I, I sort of grew up with a, a sense of my political responsibility that comes alongside knowing that um, I was living on occupied land. And I've sort of been following the work of some Indigenous scholars and allied scholars who talk about the ways that treaties are the relations, are the responsibilities of all of us. So we're all treaty people and we all have a responsibility to uh, um, understand and live up to the treaties um, on the territories that we live on. My work is also um, marked by a commitment to reflexive and radical relationality. So ethnographic research, political organizing, and movements for decolonization are all bound up with how we develop a sense of connection to one another. Reflexive relationality in many ways is the core foundation from which all other social and political work stems. All knowledge production and political action is relational. So how we develop good relations with one another matters. And that seems to be um, important for a course like yours that, that is sort of centering indigenous knowledge and thinking through um, Indigenous environmental planning, which would require working with Indigenous communities um, 
I also um, approach my research and writing with through a lens of decolonial methodologies. So I believe it is really important to consider the problematics of research and political organizing within a world that is structured by unequal asymmetrical power relations and operating against a backdrop of ongoing colonialism. So what we study, who is involved in the conceptualization of the project, how we study, how we write, how we circulate and disseminate information, how we research, how our research and writing translates into social movements are all put part of this question. So simply put, research and advocacy for social transformation is far from a benign enterprise. It is always about power. And the last thing I just wanna say quickly is that um, I have a strong emphasis in my work on public intellectualism. And so I don't separate my work in, my, in the academy from the world outside the ivory tower. So my research is grounded in a series of academic projects, but I, I work really hard to try to translate it for a wider public and also to, um, to, to work on research and um, advocacy projects that are, are in the service of specific social movements. So before I move into the next part of my presentation, I just want to pause for a second and reflect a little bit on abolitionist politics in the context of environmental justice. And this is a tiny bit of a segue, but I'll get back to the sort of heart of my talk in a section in a second. Um, and um, I think in this current moment, as we think about the social movements that are, are very present in the United States, questions about abolition are more important than ever. Um, and I'm interested in thinking about what abolition means when it is situated within the purview of conditions of occupation and conquest in the context of ongoing colonial violence across the social institutions of child welfare, criminal justice, law, education, housing, healthcare, and against the backdrop of persistent land disposition for native nations. What does it mean to call oneself an abolitionist when you center indigenous politics and history past, present, and future? From where I'm standing, being an abolitionist means linking the long traditions of anti-colonial resistance against slavery and anti-Black violence in the United States directly with the struggle for Native liberation in this historical moment. It requires understanding how settler colonialism here is linked with imperialism worldwide. Abolition, abolitionist politics go beyond colonial borders, and so too our movements must be connected together. In order for us to achieve this kind of radical social transformation, we need to have an understanding of how colonialism is enacted against communities of color, black and indigenous people, and how this is co-constituted. It means eradicating the rampant colonial gender violence that has resulted in the horrific number of numbers of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. It means challenging and dismantling the military and law enforcement agencies that criminalize and cage revolutionaries who are demanding a different kind of world. It means holding up the authority of indigenous systems of governance over the land and waters that are essential for life to exist. Simply put, being an abolitionist means working towards the end of settler colonialism so that a new future is possible for us and the generations who come after. We have a responsibility to, to the present, perhaps more importantly, to the possibility of a future that emerges from justice and freedom instead of death and destruction. So a little bit of now about my current work um, so I began working on the politics of environmental justice through my exposure to indigenous resistance to extractive projects in the tar sands in Alberta and witnessing youth involvement in some of these resistance efforts. So young indigenous people were moving back and forth between the cities and the reserves to participate in um, um, land defense projects and then ending up back in the city to go to school and access education. Um, this was coupled with my growing interest in climate change. This coupled with my growing interest in climate change has led you know, to this work that it has centered on developing an anti-colonial critique of environmental justice politics. I also have a daughter um, who is now a senior at Brown who started work, um, started in developing an interest in environmental politics at a really early age, um, at about 13. And I started to be concerned about the way her vernacular and political sensibility was being shaped through dominant discourses and narratives within the environmental justice movement, largely uncritical and homogenizing representations of the Anthropocene that leave out an understanding of how we've arrived here in the first place. Um, so I began conducting an, inter uh, an overview of environmental studies curriculum in the United States 
um, and uncovered the paucity of literature and classes that made explicit linkages between colonialism and climate change, as well as the differential impact on frontline communities, largely communities of color and black and indigenous communities. So again, I'm really excited to hear about this class and, and the important work that you're all doing because that your class sounds like it's, it, um, I know that cl your class stands in stark contrast to what is happening in many other institutions. I also started doing a lot of reading outside of environmental anthropology, which anthropologist Paige West has recently called deeply apolitical, ahistorical, and working to elide the research and writing of indigenous scholars and scholars of color. And I found many more critical ideas about environmental justice. For example, I've started delving deep into the work of Potomotomy scholar Kyle White, who explains ecology as a system of interacting humans, non-human beings, animals, plants, et cetera, and entities and landscapes that are conceptualized and operate purposefully to facilitate a collective's adaptation to changes. Ecologies here are understood in terms of the makeup of the quality of their relationships. So what has become clear to me is that colonialism has an ecological dimension and in order for the political economy of colonialism to thrive, it requires an ongoing supply of land and water. So this brings me to a set of key questions that I've been thinking about as I've been going about the work of developing this anti-colonial critique of the environmental justice movement and centering indigenous resurgence and indigenous land and water defense movements. So some of the questions I've been thinking about are, how can environmental disaster be positioned as a form of colonial violence deeply interwoven with dispossession? What are the political modalities through which indigenous peoples are resisting colonial violence as it is materialized through environmental devastation? What are the possibilities for a linked international environmental justice movement when we pay attention to the architecture of resistance as it is being shaped and reshaped by indigenous young people across multiple locations? So given these questions, my work is attendant to the specificity of political critique that emerges through the work of indigenous scholars and their allies who are calling attention to colonial state power and relations of domination characteristic of settler colonialism in the here and now. As indigenous scholar Leanne Simpson argues more broadly about social movement theory, quote, Western-based social movement theory has failed to recognize the broader contextualizations of resistance within indigenous thought while also ignoring the contestation of colonialism as a starting point, end quote. The critical appraisals I'm about to offer move across a range of socio-political spaces and realities and carry significant import when translated to a deconstruction of the underlying politics and ideologies inherent to the dominant environmental justice movement as a whole. So there are three main points I'd like to make in this regard. Um, the first one involves indigenous knowledge within the context of environmental justice. So in the wake of a planet-wide movement riddled with idioms about saving our homes, where the ground is fast shifting and the fate of humanity's collective future is at stake, there's been a tidal wave of interest in indigenous knowledges about the land, water, and sky, a desire to capture and store the intergenerational wisdom that speaks to the unpredictable path lying ahead. Littered throughout academic writing, climate justice protests, and climate science reports, are a host of references to the importance of harnessing indigenous knowledge systems in the service of global sustainability. As a case in point, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report for um, recently states, quote, indigenous local and, not, uh, local and traditional knowledge systems and practices, including indigenous people's holistic view of community and environment are a major resource for adapting to climate change, but these have not been used consistently in existing adaptation efforts. Integrating such forms of knowledge within existing practices increases the effectiveness of adaptation, end quote. More recently, Justin Trudeau and Barack Obama issued a joint statement on climate energy and Arctic leadership, which makes an explicit reference to indigenous science and traditional knowledge by stating that Canada and the United States are committed to collaborating with indigenous and Arctic governments, leaders and communities to more broadly and res respectfully include indigenous science and traditional knowledge into decision-making, including environmental assessments, resource management, and advancing our understanding of climate change and how best to manage its effect. Particularly noteworthy within both of these frames is the vernacular of integration and, inc and inclusion that underlies the broader impetus for seeking indigenous knowledge. What I mean by this is that while at first glance we might consider these inclusionary politics to be a move in the right direction, the integration of indigenous knowledge as something to be used 
um, in the interests of global recovery from climate crisis, I believe it merits a deeper and more nuanced reading pushing us to consider the problematics associated with the state-driven discovery of Indigenous knowledge. Deborah McGregor highlights the ways that Indigenous knowledge of the environment is derived through a living process that stems from Indigenous relationships to creation and is generated through a body of ancient thought, experience, and action. It is generated by the things that one does ra rather than something that one simply knows. She argues that the natural world, environment, or creation is an essential part of the conception of indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is not just knowledge per se, it is the lives lived by people and their particular relationship with creation. From Gregor's perspective, indigenous knowledge is not a noun. It is not a commodity or a product that can be drawn upon as a last ditch effort to be integrated into a battalion of adaptive solutions to save us all. To acquire this knowledge requires meaning, means entirely shifting our current patterns of living in the everyday. It is cumulative and dynamic, adaptive and spiritual, and it is produced in a collective process that is fundamentally centered on the way that one relates. Mashana Goman further this, furthers this point when she speaks of the complexity, history, and political vitality in a storied land, of land that is literally and figuratively acts as a placeholder that moves through time and situates indigenous knowledges. Indigenous scholars, Goman writes, must continue to think of space or the function of land as more than a site upon which humans make history or as a location that accumulates history. We might ask then whose interests are being served when the settler state and its movement agents attempt to extract and distill bits and pieces of indigenous knowledge to work in the service of climate recovery. What is lost in this process of integration when it is not occurring in conjunction with moves towards decolonization that center the question of colonization and its impacts, when there is not a clear intention to understand how the colonial spatial restructuring of the land has affected indigenous relationships to this land. How might this knowledge be exploited to maintain Canada and the United States, to borrow Eileen Morton Robinson's phrase, as white possessions? An appropriation of indigenous knowledge which omits any explicit commitment to the radical political reordering of the materials and power that are required to save the planet will simply be more of the same. Second, and this is a this art, this um, point is about the way that um, indigenous people become framed within the dominant environmental justice movement. So second, indigenous peoples often factor into debates about climate change in relation to questions of impact on frontline communities and related issues associated with the maintenance of traditional lifestyles. They are showcased, in other words, in terms of the most immediate and visible harm occurring as a result of runaway fossil fuel extraction and capitalist development. While this is undoubtedly important to consider and localized resistance efforts around environmental destruction should of course be waged, I'm concerned that this representation alone runs the risk of obscuring the historical and political context in which these extractive projects have taken flight in the first place and reduces the far reaching power of settler colonialism to an isolated location where the effects can be most visibly seen. Kyle White succinctly captures this fundamental point when he says, quote, anthropogenic human caused climate change is an intensification of environmental change imposed on indigenous peoples by colonialism, end quote. In Wastelanding, Legacies of Uranium Mining in Navajo Country, Tracy Voyle similarly insists, quote, although scholars of environmental justice studies most often focus on contemporary post-1982 examples of environmental injustice, Native Americans are quick to note that the tendency of those in power to exert their power by manipulating resources and degrading the natural environment is something with which colonized people are all too familiar. In fact, the most workable date for the founding of the native environmental justice movement is 1492. The temporal sensibilities that animate liberal environmentalists' concerns are distinct from the sense of time experienced by indigenous peoples who have had to survive environmental catastrophe since the initiation of the colonial project. From the vantage point of indigenous resistance, the environmental crisis is coexistive with the time of colonialism. Resistance efforts to halt the contamination and toxicity from industrial projects then must be simultaneously linked to a long-term strategy of indigenous, advancing indigenous freedom and the resurgence of indigenous governance systems that demand a different relationality to the land, water, and air. 
cleaning up toxic mess at one site will not stop a state with its formative roots in colonial capitalism from finding another one down the road where the power to resist and organize may be less viable. The settler colonies of the United States and Canada have always been preoccupied with questions of quote unquote natural resources, the desire for them, the management of them, and the ability to translate them into profit. Coupled with a consistent portrayal of frontline damage is also an invocation of Indigenous rights as a potential strategic avenue to curb industrial development. And this can be found throughout the climate justice movement where the language of protecting the commons reigns. Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, for example, contains numerous references to the potential utility of Indigenous legal rights as a way to safeguard what she calls the, quote, unexploded carbon, bom carbon bombs that lie beneath the lands and waters to which Indigenous peoples have legitimate legal claims, end quote. While I certainly see Merritt and Klein's calls to mobilize alongside frontline Indigenous communities to halt extraction and industrial development, I'm suspect of the instrumental framing of Indigenous rights as a way to protect us all against the whims of settler colonial state agents, when settler publics in both the United States and Canada have done little to address the ongoing dispossession and elimination of Indigenous peoples, a politics of elimination that made it possible for this kind of industrial development to unfurl, unfold in the first place, I might add. Moreover, this kind of strategic instrumentalism does not appear to be linked to the broader goals of Indigenous political claims to their territory and self-determination that would require a deliberate undoing of settler state governance. Such an omission could potentially open the door to an advocation of political responsibility. Even the language of rights as a choice of political vernacular and framing here reinscribes settler state power as the ultimate authority since rights are mediated or granted, granted by the settler state itself. This is not to say that Indigenous communities' use of legal mechanisms are not important and useful in the retelling of the story of colonialism and its links with environmental devastation. Counter narratives about Indigenous relations to the land and the ways that colonial violence operated to separate them from it must be told and one way there's one way where this um sorry and one way this counterscript can be written it rewritten is in the realm of legal rights yet it is imperative that we are also careful about identifying the limits of these forms of political contestation um, and also when legal rights become utilized instrumentally the third argument um, and point that i want to make around this is um, uh, around an anti-colonial critique of capitalism. So my third point revolves around critiques of capitalism that are found throughout the environmental justice movement and presented clearly in Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate and Jason Moore's Capitalism in the Web of Life. And I use these two books because they're widely used throughout environmental studies curriculums. Both of these books call for a civilization wake up call that forces us to contend with our current political paradigm that, as Klein puts it, is based on our socially constructed right to extract ever more without facing consequences, our capacity to bend complex natural systems to our will. Moore pushes this further by referring to capitalism as more than an economic system, economic and social system. Instead, he describes capitalism as a way of organizing nature based on a nature society dualism that places humans outside of nature. Capitalism, more contends, is above all a system of cheap nature consisting of the four cheaps, labor power, energy, food, and raw materials. As far as critiques of the economic ordering of our world go, both of these works make a substantial contribution. Where they fall short, however, is in making an explicit and sustained linkage between capitalism and colonialism, and the way that, as Cheryl Harris brings into stark relief in her seminal work on whiteness as property, property rights in countries like the United States, as a case in point, are rooted in racial domination. As Harris importantly explains, the hyper-exploitation of Black labor was accomplished by treating Black people themselves as objects of property, Race and property were thus conflated by establishing a form of property contingent on race. Only blacks were subject, subjugated as slaves and treated as property. Similarly, the conquest, removal and extermination of Native American life and culture was ratified by conferring and acknowledging the property rights of whites on Native American land. Only white possession and occupation of land was validated and therefore privileged as a basis for pro pro property rights. These, 
distinct forms of exploitation, each contributed in varying ways to the construction of whiteness as property, end quote. Both of these works in light of Harris's offering, in other words, have sidelined the role of colonialism in the proliferation of the kind of racial capitalism that has wreaked havoc on the planet as we know us. As Voyos reminds us, quote, remaking native land as settler home involves the exploitation of environmental resources to be sure, but it also involves a deeply complex construction of land as either always already belonging to the settler, his manifest destiny, or as undesirable, unproductive, or unappealing, in short, as wasteland, end quote. Together, colonialism and capitalism laid key parts of the groundwork for industrialization and militarization and carbon intensive economies, which produced the drivers of anthropogenic climate change. An analytic move that would center the dispossession of indigenous peoples from their whole homelands more centrally in debates over climate justice and allow us to integrate more fully the practices of colonial capitalist accumulation that are foundational to the creation of climate change is thus urgently required. In Red Skin, White Masks, Glenn Cuthard adapts Marx's theory of primitive accumulation to paint a picture of capitalism through the colonial relation itself, thereby elevating the injustice of colonial dispossession as a key, as key to capitalist accumulation in the settler state of Canada. In the opening pages, Cuthard writes, quote, I believe that establishing the colonial relation of dispossession as a co-foundational feature of our, our understanding of and critical engagement with capitalism opens up the possibility of developing a more ecologically attentive critique of colonial capitalist accumulation, especially if this engagement takes its cues from the grounded normativity of indigenous modalities of place-based resistance and criticism, end quote. The turn to a robust colonial framing of capitalism then sets the stage for thinking through the multifarious intersectional ways that colonial capitalism works through numerous access of exploitation configured along race, gender, class, and state lines in order to translate natural resources into profit. Thus, while I'm in political agreement with an anti-capitalist uh, vision to counter environmental crisis, these movements need to be answerable to Indigenous peoples. Without such accountability, we will stifle our ability to reflect upon and shift our political strategies and tactics of resistance so that we are attentive to questions of conquest and occupation as much as we are attentive to extreme weather, rising sea levels, and global warming. Climate change organizers can simultaneously be engaged in Indigenous elimination while fighting for a particular version of social and political order on the planet that reproduces the political economy of settler states. So how do Indigenous-led responses to environmental devastation and climate change shift how we understand and constitute the meaning of environmental justice? Let me give you a couple of examples from my recent fieldwork to demonstrate how these theoretical interventions I have just made are set in motion on the ground when we take a closer look at Indigenous-led resistance to ongoing fossil fuel development and related environmental ruin. So the first example um, I want to share centers on my research and organizing work to support the Standing Rock Sioux's resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to assume some basic familiar familiarity with the struggle against DAPL. Um, and there are many important things that Indigenous-led resistance here revealed, but in terms of the environmental movement, a few things stand out. And I'm suffering, summarizing these here um, now because of time limitations. So one of the things that we learned from Standing Rock, um, again, an indigenous led water and land defense movement um, was that it clearly in, illustrates that a fight for environmental justice must be framed first and foremost as a struggle for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. A closer look at Standing Rock reveals that the Sioux Nation never ceded the 1851 treaty lands that lie at the center of their opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline. In the Supreme Law of the Land, Nick Estes and Jeffrey Osler importantly remind us that there is no question about the accuracy of Standing Rock's contention that the pipeline is being constructed across lands recognized as Sioux territory under the 1851 treaty. Following in the footsteps of a long history of violence and encroachment on Indigenous homelands, energy transfer partners with the support of the federal government violated this treaty relationship between the US settler state and the Sioux Nation, even though treaties, as Estes and Osler explain, are regarded by the US Constitution 
as the supreme laws of the land. In a similar vein, Heidi Stark offers a critical analysis of the ways that the imposition of colonial law allowed the United States to increasingly undermine indigenous authority and assert jurisdiction over indigenous peoples and their lands. Political moves that were in direct violation of treaty relationships and required in order to actively produce settler state sovereignty over the land. This imposition of colonial law paved the way for the criminal actions of emerging settler states to be positioned as legal while casting indigenous resistance as inherently unlawful and illegitimate. Indeed, this projection of the water protectors in Standing Rock and their allies as criminal, violent, essentially as a threat to the political authority of colonial state power, enabled the United States to avert attention away from its own illegality and egregious violence against the Sioux Nation. Simply put, this is a story about the illegitimacy of the United States. Second, the resistance at Standing Rock also makes visible the reality of systemic violence and injustice that is part of everyday life for indigenous communities and the inescapable ongoing fact of settler complicity in reproducing these dynamics. The struggle for water at Standing Rock thus is also a struggle against what Rob Nixon calls the slow violence of toxic buildup. And I'm not just speaking to environmental racism here, across a range of life experiences for indigenous people. So a resistance movement that is centered on protecting the Minnesota or the Missouri River is also a movement that speaks to the interconnected forms of structural violence that are tightly woven together. A struggle for water becomes a struggle for decolonization and justice as a whole, limited access to education that is centered in indigenous epistemology, inadequate housing, extreme levels of poverty, police state violence, and the criminalization of native people through the invention of colonial law truncated access to healthcare and the ongoing seizure of indigenous homelands through treaty violations are all part of the resistance at Standing Rock. And in all of this, colonial gender violence takes center stage, takes center stage. A struggle for environmental justice then is a call to end colonial structural violence more broadly and colonial gender violence against indigenous women and youth remains at the center of advocacy and political strategies in this movement. And the last thing I wanna argue and point out about Standing Rock is that this struggle struck at the heart of what Nicholas Brown terms settler accumulation or accumulation by possession. The actions of the Standing Rock Sioux became overtly demarcated by the state as a threat to settler sovereignty and a destabilization of carbon intensive economies that are foundational to US racial capitalism. Colonial systems of capitalist accumulation tied directly to the invention of private property open the floodgates from nat for natural resources to be transported from oil and gas fields, refineries, lumber mills, mining operations, and hydroelectric facilities located on the dispossessed lands of indigenous nations to international markets. The economic infrastructures in settler colonies like the United States and Canada depend on extractive industries. DAPL then was one of the most recent incarnations of violence that has found its legitimation and footing in colonialism and occupation. The counterterrorism tactics and militarized response of the state towards the water protectors reveals the degree to which the state will go to protect settler accumulation and keeps, keep the wheels of, the, of colonial capitalism turning. So I'm gonna turn my attention to another example for my field work. Further north on um, Turtle Island, another indigenous land defense movement against the fossil fuel industry reveals similar facets about the deeper politics of environmental justice. The Wet'suwet'en nation under the governance of their hereditary chiefs are opposing the largest fracking project in Canadian history. And the Wet'suwet'en nation are divided into five clans and 13 house groups. And the Unistoten house group is at the helm of this struggle. The land and water defense movement is centered on the opposition of the uh, opposition to the coastal gas link pipeline owned by TC Energy, formerly TransCanada, the same corporation responsible for the Keystone pipeline. Um, CGL attempts to connect the fracking operations of northeastern BC with a liquefied natural gas LNG facility in the coastal town of Kitimat. This export terminal called LNG Canada is owned by a consortium of multinational oil giants, including Shell and PetroChina. The coastal gas link pipeline is intended to be 670 kilometers long. It is one of the many proposed pipelines attempting to cut across Wet'suwet'en tra Wet traditional territories. 
If built, it could expedite the construction of fracked gas pipelines and create an incentive for gas companies to tap into shale deposits along the pipeline right of way. This project aims to blaze a trail in what has been envisioned as an energy corridor through some of the only ecologically intact areas left in this entire region. If the coastal gas link pipeline were to be built and become operational, it would irreversibly transform the ecology and character of Wet'suwet'en territory in what is now known as Northern British Columbia, Canada. In the fall of 2019, I was invited by leaders of the land defense movement to visit the territory and begin documenting the police violence and mounting militarized response against the indigenous land defenders. And if you wanna learn more about this, you can read um, the two pieces I wrote for The Guardian in late December of 2019. And while I don't have time to delve into all the specifics here, and I'm just beginning to write about some of the additional violence um, enacted by the RCMP in this territory, some re preliminary reflections re reveal parallels with the resistance at Standing Rock. For example, when conducting an interview with Frida Hewson, the spokesperson for the Unistoten House Group, she explained to me that this land defense movement was also a struggle over indig indigenous jurisdiction. Um, she told me, quote, the Wet'suwet'en nation have lived on and governed their territory for thousands of years. They have never signed treaties or sold their land to Canada, end quote. In 1997, Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs joined with the Gitsan hereditary chiefs and won the landmark Delgamuk Supreme Court case in Canada. The court recognized that the Wet'suwet'en people had never given up title to the 22,000 square kilometers of land in northern British Columbia, an area the size of New Jersey. The court decision also recognized Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs as the title holders who maintain the authority and jurisdiction to make decisions on unceded lands. Despite these rulings, however, the governments of Canada and British Columbia continue to assert jurisdiction over this territory and have issued permits for resource projects without the consent of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. Wet'suwet'en people upholding decisions made in accordance with the Wet'suwet'en law have been criminalized by the Canadian state and face the risk of arrest for controlling access to their homelands. As was the case at Standing Rock then, the Wet'suwet'en nation is also challenging the political economy of settler colonialism by maintaining their hereditary governance structures. Settler accumulation and Canadian state formation seek to continually integrate indigenous lands into the capitalist economy through a long history of colonial violence that is carrying forward. The white possessive logics of the Canadian settler state working in concert with corporations like TC Energy are in direct conflict with indigenous authority and governance structures. And the last thing I wanna mention here, and this is building on the work of Sri Pasternak and Anne Spice, is that Wet'suwet'en land defenders are enacting an ontology of care for their territory that stands in sharp contrast to the idea that land and water are simply resources. Their legal orders and governance of the territory stems from relations of respect and knowledge of the land that are reflected in their everyday practices and engagement with human and other than human relations. And if you haven't read Clinkett scholar Anne Spice's article, Fighting Invasive Infrastructure, which chronicles this resistance, I would highly recommend it. So now part three. My work charting Indigenous-led movements for environmental justice in Indigenous North America has made me think a lot about what we might be able to learn if we extend this analysis globally. My interest at Standing Rock also started with youth leadership and the ways that Indigenous young people were leading the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline. So why this focus on the global? Why does this matter? First, we know that Indigenous assertions of governance over their lands and bodies have been foundational in anti-colonial struggles worldwide which compromise the capacity of governments to sell quote unquote resources on lands that were never ceded or surrendered. We know that the natural resource economy is pivotal to the national economy of many colonial state structures. Indigenous peoples are also currently protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity and are often the most confrontational arm of environmental resistance. In addition, we know that there is a rise in global indigenous politics that represents a real and direct threat to both the existing international system of sovereign states and the contemporary liberal world, world, or, or, world order. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, coupled with an expansion of the platforms through which indigenous peoples are organizing across distinct geographical locations, has produced the condition, conditions under which notions of self-determination and decolonization are shifting. <clears throat> and notably, as Cheryl Lightfoot points out in her recent book, 
global indigenous politics, the rise of global indigenous politics demonstrates that new forms of political relations are possible. And these political relations are moving outside of formal state structures. So based on this shift to the global, I'm gonna just share now a little bit about my emerging multi-sided ethnographic project, which has kind of been on hold because of the COVID-19 global pandemic, um, with the caveat that this is still under development. So tentatively titled Anti-Colonial Youth Politics, Resistance and in global, global Environmental Justice, this uh, work has sprung from my growing interest in issues of climate change and my longstanding work with indigenous communities and youth specifically, many of who, who, whom have been involved in resistance efforts against extractivism. And I, when I use the, the language of extractivism, I'm drawing on the work of Macarena Gomez Barras, who describes it as, quote, the colonial paradigm, worldview, and technologies that mark out regions of high biodiversity in order to reproduce or in order to reduce life to um, capitalist resource conversion, end quote. In this conceptualization of extractivism then, extractivism then, Gomez Barras it, characterizes it as a colonial capitalism and its afterlives. For her, it is the theft, forced removals, and violent reorganization of social life, as well as the land by thieving from indigenous and Afro-descendant territories. And it references the dramatic material change to social and ecological life that underpins this arrangement. So if we take a moment to step back and consider where indigenous young people, just as they did at Standing Rock, enter this picture, um, we learn that they are situated at, this, at the intersection of precarity and possibility. Indigenous youth are makers of something I'm beginning to interpret as a kind of anti-colonial entropy, a networked set of ideas, beliefs, and organizing efforts crucial to fostering a political condition of decolonial disorder in our current reality of racial capitalism, violent state sovereignty, and a persistent avowal of present future where colonial power reigns supreme. Anti-colonial entropy is orchestrated by indigenous youth, promotes degradation of the social and political infrastructure necessary to sustain colonial societies. It is necessarily unsettling, anti-hegemonic, and an anchored to political goals of self-determination and liberation. So in many ways, I would envision this research as also an interruption of the way indigenous peoples and indigenous youth specifically have been narrowly portrayed as passive recipients of a colonial project in many much academic writing, and as an avenue to bring visibility to their imaginative power in the face of remarkable challenges posed by the persistence of colonial violence as experienced differentially in the three different sites where this project is taking place. What might we, we learn from their lines of sight? This research, I would, I would argue, however, is also important because it has a potential to serve as a platform from which we can begin to understand the complex linkages among colonialism, racial capitalism, and environmental devastation um, on a global scale. Indeed, part of the work of this project is to think across different geographical locations to consider how the architecture of decolonization emerges through environmental resistance efforts led by indigenous young people across the globe and to determine how they may be producing new forms of revolutionary um, strategy that are not immedi immediately legible. Young people are contesting dominant power relations through multiple forms of social and political critique and we can, and these are emerging and there are emerging ecolo ecologies of protest and resistance. And we can see this, of course, in Hong Kong and Sudan and in India, Greece, Canada, the United States, Cambodia, Mexico, many other places. So I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes now telling you a little bit about the three sites where this work is taking place before I close out. Um, and I'm about a couple of minutes, um, I think, from finishing now. So I've already told you um, quite a bit about um, the resistance at Standing Rock and what I, I think we can learn from indigenous led water and land defense movements. But I wanna um, talk a little bit about the indigenous young people that were central to the organizing efforts at Standing Rock. Um, so the research that I, the research and work and organizing work that I conducted there helped me to begin to outline the ecologies of decolonial organizing as it is spearheaded and led by indigenous young people. So at Standing Rock, these centered on bringing subjugated knowledges forward and elevating silenced narratives about contemporary native life. 
They also focused on embodied ways of being in relation to one another as humans existing amongst and within an other than human world and demanding a future that is accountable to them and the generations yet to be born. This sentiment was captured beautifully in an interview I conducted with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, founder of the Sacred Stone Camp. When I asked her about the role of youth at Standing Rock, she told me, quote, when things started happening at Dapple, it was the youth who ran the chants, the youth who ran the marches and the youth that we followed. We have to listen to them. They are fighting for the right to live. They are fighting for the right to have water. They are fighting for their futures. They are fighting for their children, for what comes next. I believe these young people stood up to heal a nation and that's what I see them doing. So it is and always has been them and their words. There is power in these youth. There is prayer and ceremony in what they speak. When they speak, they speak the truth." End quote. Through their organizing efforts, indigenous young people at Standing Rock consistently demonstrated that the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline was also a struggle against the violent materialism of what it means to live and breathe to exist within colonial systems, structures, within occupation, and that these experiences are intergenerational, moving back and forth in time. So the second site where I'm gonna be conducting this work and I've already started um, prior to the pandemic um, is in Ratnakiriya, Cambodia, which is in the Northeast section of Cambodia, which stands as a clear signpost of China's international push to acquire minerals, fossil fuels, agriculture, agricultural commodities and timber from a variety of states. These hills are home to numerous indigenous tribes, the Karung and Jirai are among two, among many ethnic groups that have been, that for centuries have been called, um, have called what is now known as modern, modern day Rotten, Rotten, um, Ratnakiri home. In this Northeast section of the country and many other parts of Cambodia, China is involved in a dizzying variety of resource extraction, energy, agriculture and infrastructure projects roads, railways, hydro dams, mines um, that are wreaking unprecedented damage to ecosystems and biodiversity. Concerns over China's presence in Cambodia have been expressed by indigenous peoples who are on the front lines of halting rampant deforestation, land grabbing, illegal logging, and the granting of mining concessions. Um, and in this area of Cambodia, indigenous communities are making visible the impacts of climate change that have already drastically altered their livelihoods and ways of living and indigenous youth are once again central to these organizing efforts. They are calling attention to the contamination of food and water sources caused by development projects that have come alongside China's presence in Cambodia, projects that are often positioned by the Cambodian government as beneficial for the economic prosperity of the country. Lack of rainfall has created dire conditions in a country where 80% of the population relies on agriculture. The work in Cambodia is supported by my long standing relationship to the Panhiri Lee Foundation, a small Khmer um, community organization based in Siem Reap, and my connections to Lakato, one of the only organizations in Cambodia documenting land grabbing and human rights violations, um, and also connected to the Cambodian Indigenous Youth Association. So finally, this third site that I think offers us um, some important um, lines of, um, of um, insight is in North Sikkim, India, where Lepcha indigenous youth went on a hunger strike to protest against the Indian Power Ministry's plan to develop seven hydroelectric dams as a means to increase energy production in the Himalayan states. Citing the failure of the Indian government to foster employment opportunities in a country beset by endemic poverty and deprivation, these indigenous young people were critically questioning a state directed development agenda that did not serve the interests of the communities. They were able to garner enough international attention that four out of the seven hydroelectric projects um, were canceled. And um, for more on this, you can see the work of Mabel, Ger Mabel Gergen, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out and, and understand how this project is, this, these political uh, resistance efforts are evolving and moving forward. Um, so in closing, I wanna say that um, it is my contention that these young people across these different sites offer us new ways of seeing and understanding the politics of climate change, as well as offering possibilities for radical resistance that are embedded within context, history, and place. To put it succinctly, Indigenous people and youth are the critical mass threading together and sustaining the anti-colonial entropy necessary for revolutionary liberation that will bring forth alternative forms of existence on the planet. In doing so, their bravery and brilliance should compel all of us to ask ourselves what we are willing to fight for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh...
there are um, many questions and comments um, and I would like to give as many people as possible a chance to engage with you and to have a chance to hear your reactions. Um, I'm going to resist the, <laughs> the opportunity to present some questions of my own and, and let uh, if we could start with Disha who's asked the first question. Um, how might we as allies push back against such instrumentalism of indigenous legal rights and commodification of traditional eco ecological knowledge as a noun object rather than as a living collective? And I, and I think the spirit of a lot of the questions because of the place where we are and what we teach and what, what our educational mission is, um, assume people buy your diagnosis. Now, they want to know how to mobilize, not just understand what to mobilize, what can they do as individuals, what should they not attempt to do as individuals. So to the extent we can make action, at least part of the focus of your prescriptive response, that would be great. I also just want to give people who have dropped their questions a chance to, to say hi and to introduce themselves too, just so we can start to build these relationships. So, Disha, if you want to say hello. Hi, I'm Disha. Um, I'm a first year in the technology and policy program here at MIT. I really appreciated this talk. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I can definitely take a stab at that. Um, so I think that the, the the question is always, you know, um, what do we do now, right? Once we develop critical ways of understanding and thinking about these questions. And I sort of think about this um, the same way that I think about my research and advocacy, which is um, the importance of relationships. So when I think about what it means to support an indigenous land and water defense movement, or I think about how important it might be to, um, draw upon indigenous epistemology or knowledge systems, I think about the relationships that I have to people, to indigenous people um, across a range of different kinds of communities who can help to provide guidance and direction about what that looks like. So part of the thing is that it's not up to me to decide how that knowledge and um, should be, should be used or integrated or even how to sort of support a political resistance movement that guidance comes from people that are um, living and working and carried a kind of embodied knowledge of um, their communities, their place and their history. Um, and I take direction from them. And I find that you know, the work of Kim Tallbear, when she talks about what, how, how to stand with um, indigenous communities, how you develop kind of relationships of um, reflexivity and reciprocity over time. And Linda Taiwai Smith, obviously decolonizing methodologies also provides um, a lot of direct guidance around how to develop relationships with indigenous communities that are based on political commitments that have long standing um, that that have long standing and long term um, kinds of relationships and goals. And I think those are all part of of the um, the way that I think about what it means to work alongside. Um, indigenous peoples in their struggle for liberation and environmental justice politics is one piece of that. Uh, did you, you want to respond or extend that a, a bit further? I just want to say, I think that you spoke a little bit to another question that I asked, which was about practice and how you center advocacy in your academic practice. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Um, not surprisingly, given that we're at MIT, uh, uh, Jessica, and, um, technology comes up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of questions. Um, and I think uh, there are those of us at MIT who know that technology can be used in a lot of different ways, have been used in a lot of different ways. Um, but does the, <coughs> does the desire to integrate a more positive technology fit within the prescriptive frame that you are developing? Or is the fact that it is from, by definition, the newer technologies are by definition from a settler or a colonial source? Mm 
-hmm. mean that uh, it, it's a false hope that they somehow integrate with uh, indigenous knowledge or they come to the rescue in some way in the relationship between indigenous and settler communities. How do you think about new technology and its part in the bigger story that you're telling? Well, I think that's a good question. And, you know, I, I think one of the responses I could offer is that, you know, indigenous peoples are adaptive also, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not like it's a, a static set of peoples caught in time in a particular historical moment. Um, and I think I, I, there are, you know, a range of ways in which, um, you know, technology as it's sort of being developed now is um, integrated or adapted in the service of particular kinds of um, strategies around environmental justice or um, addressing environmental devastation. You know, so there are um, numerous ways that I think technology is being drawn upon. I think the key here though are, is to control the terms under which technology becomes used and for what purpose, right? So the integration of technology also has a set of political questions attached to it, right? So what is the purpose of it? How is it going to transform and alter material conditions in the everyday? What are the long-term goals of a form of technology in thinking about it as part of a, a longer term strategy that uh, addresses questions of environmental justice, but also acknowledges the history and contemporary realities of settler colonialism. So I think it's about like who controls the terms under which things become <clears throat> introduced, integrated, adapted, utilized, and how the kind of power around those things becomes dispersed and decision making becomes shared or you know indigenous communities and people have the ability to make those decisions on their own terms there were three or four people who had questions regarding some aspects of technology new and old do any of you who've asked those questions i know some of you had one and sanjan had one do you want to follow up and 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 push further on that either with a statement or a further question uh, to Dr. Dillon. Hi, yeah, um, I'm happy to make a quick addition if that's okay. I'm Sanjana, it's great to meet you. Um, I'm an associate in the Sensible City Lab at MIT um, and I'm currently on Chesapeake lands in Southern Virginia, but I will be up uh, in Cambridge pretty soon. So yeah, it's just kind of the question of, um, you know, how we grapple with the relationship that technology has had uh, to like extractive capitalism versus all of the benefits it, have, uh, it has, you know, so since, since the beginning of time, it's been a double-edged sword and just kind of how do we balance the perspective benefits that it has for liberation, for improving quality of life for people, for improving connectedness with kind of the use cases that it has and the roots that it has in extractive capitalism and often in violence, given how much of technology is developed from a defense perspective. So how do we hold that on the one hand and kind of understand how we in what is known as or what's usually called a tech space can, you know, contribute to anti-colonialism, anti-extractivism, while also balancing, uh, you know, supporting indigenous innovators uh, and understanding the really painful history of where that comes from. That's such a fantastic question. And I just wanted to add just one thing because we were kind of in dialogue in the chat a little bit. Um, I, I think infrastructure has a very similar um, role if you think about you know, how it's so often kind of this um, kind of capitalistic tool that just kind of enables further extraction. But also, we also have to think about how um, many Native American reservations are some of the the least have the least infrastructure access of, of anywhere in the in North America, really. So we the rates of electrification and access to running water and that supportive infrastructure are much lower. And so then how do we, you know, as to get back to this question about practice, like how do we identify the extractive and capitalist influences when projects are being proposed and kind of head those off, as well as um, I think with the use of technology. So just wanted to tack that on if that's okay. Yeah, no, these are great questions. And I feel like, you know, um, since you're steeped in this, I'm sure you spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, how 
to address the inherent sort of contradictions of what Western science and technology have historically offered and the violence that also I think continues to be reproduced in, you know, in various formulations of science disciplines across um, academic institutions in the United States and elsewhere. So I think, um, I think part of this is developing a kind of a way of talking about science that allows one to center a kind of anti-colonial and indigenous critique of how it becomes produced as a discipline. I think part of the problem is the way, again, I would say that, you know, in, in an interaction with someone that um, <clears throat> a scientist, an expert scientist who's developed a particular kind of quote unquote product or technology that may or may not be useful in the sort of long-term goal of environmental justice work has a way of presenting themselves in relationship to indigenous communities. So I think the work, again, I would argue of relationships, of political goals, of purpose, right? How you think about what it means to have somebody that's situated in the, con in the, the sort of um, the institutional space of a university or a research lab of some kind interact with somebody who holds an entirely different set of knowledge systems that could also be understood as scientific, right? But the positions that they hold in our society, the attendant privileges and benefits and um, expertise and authority that come alongside those things are located in very different, are, are end up, um, are constructed in very different ways. And so part of this is, is I think, um, working alongside, again, not working for, not working, but working alongside and with indigenous peoples who are committed to understanding the use and development of these technologies. And again, I would say there, there is a, a longstanding critique of science, Western science too, right? That can go alongside um, the ways that we think about what modern technologies have to offer us in this moment. So it's not to say that it's a, um, and, and again, I will say there is indigenous peoples and communities are heterogeneous you know, and also adaptive. And so I think it, it also depends on the, the region and community and technology and the location that you're speaking about too. It's, it's a little bit hard to think about it without paying attention to that level of specificity. Thank you. Um, one of our commenters, and I'm gonna ask Terry in a minute to join the conversation, um, raises the spiritual side of the, mm -hmm, let's call it environmental justice uh, movement or, or the absence of a spiritual element for some in the environmental justice movement. Mm -hmm. Presumably an indigenous perspective on environmental justice of the sort you were beginning to elaborate plays up, centers a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. and um, there have been groups uh, on environment and spirituality, environment and religion uh, in, in, in this Cambridge community for the many generations, decades and decades, and they haven't made much progress when even talking about how um, standard, clearly defined Western religions work side by side when mm -hmm. their spiritual core is different. And how do, does this side-by-side -side model work with indigenous and non-indigenous communities where indigenous communities put a, such importance on the spiritual source of the, the inspiration for what people are doing when we talk about environmental justice related things in particular, but not only, uh, and the other communities don't, or if they do, their whole sense of what spiritual purpose means is totally different. So um, I, again, um, the questions that were asked on this initially, um, I, I'd love to give Terry a chance to say something about this, um, but I'd love to hear your response to that. Sure, does, it per, does the whoever posed the question wanna speak? Osama, can you unmute? Terry? Uh, can you introduce yeah, yourself this, as well, please? Yeah, this is Terry. Um, 
I was mostly making a comment, but I guess I have that question for you. It's like, how has that been for you, like on that spiritual track, like sitting with this and sitting with your own culture, where you're coming from around you, working with people? Like, um, I find myself a really big struggle around my own frustration and anger. Like, I'm coming out of organizing in Portland from the houseless community. And then we got, I got sent to Paris for the climate talks and, you know, reintroduced to the round downs, reintroduced to, uh, the welcoming of all humans into that whole multi uh, diversity of creation. And, you know, I have a really big frustration for myself around me that there's so much of not connecting to life going on. And that's the colonial thing for all of us, you know, and it's a whole struggle for us to connect to the life in our bodies and respect the knowledge in our bodies. Because this is the first landscape we have is our bodies. And then how to connect that to the earth. So like I'm on this internal track and working from the peer specialist movement, which is coming out of people who are mental health, uh, psychiatric survivors. It's like torture is part of this picture. Houselessness is part of this picture. We talk talking about infrastructure, infrastructure for all beings. And like, you know, like here in the academic is like really stepped into a lot of privilege to be able to go to school. But it's also a separating process, you know, head, 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 knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. But what does your body know? And um, so I just have a question here about what your journey has been like. Um, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's, a uh, that's a big question, um, but an important one. I, I can just say sort of to, to sort of bracket a piece of it, which is um, the sort of the way in the ways in which, you know, spirituality and, and um, ceremony present themselves in <clears throat> indigenous land and water defense movements and um, in my support and, and work alongside communities. I've really been careful to, um, very careful and respectful of um, walking, you know, supporting specific kinds of work, but not treading into areas that I don't know very much about. So again, I will take direction and <clears throat> listen to um, indigenous elders and leaders in their communities around how and when those things happen. And I think that for me, I feel more um, comfortable in the realm of kind of political material um, goals that are directed by the community. And then um, I think that, you know, there, there is obviously a very strong ceremonial and spiritual component, but there is also a very strong political component, right? So those things are not often separate from one another, but, you know, as someone who, you know, doesn't have and carry that knowledge, doesn't work, you know, and understand the significance and the, um, the sort of, the history of these ceremonies in the same way that somebody from a community will be like, I think one needs to tread very carefully and respectfully around how that becomes part of a conversation. I think for me as a, as a anti-colonial scholar who grew up on Treaty 6 territory, who's thought a lot about my political responsibility to native liberation on Turtle Island, I think about what it is that I can do and contribute and what makes sense for me to do and contribute given who I am on this territory. And there's some things that I will speak to and undertake, and there are some things I will not, right? Because I don't believe that it's my place to do those things, right? Which is very kind of anti-anthropologist in some ways, right? Because, you know, anthropologists are trained to go and study people and places and are positioned as experts. And, and I think we have to be really careful and thoughtful about how and when we um, conduct our research and writing and organizing, right? And this is part of of the work of learning, um, situating a different history and politics in something like an environmental justice movement. Um, and I think this is something I'm very, I'm very, I think, well equipped as a scholar and an organizer to write about state violence, to document colonial state violence, to advocate around those things. But there's some things that I'm not as well positioned to do. Um, I know that you have a hard stop um, because you have other another obligation, am I correct in assuming that we're just about at that moment where you have to leave? Yeah, I have about five minutes. 
Okay. Uh, I, I'd love to use the five minutes. There are three or four people with questions waiting. Let me just, because uh, we, as institutionally as MIT, we need to ask you this question. Uh, Tyler, do you want to uh, ask your question about um, what, 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 what's your view about the kind of research you're doing being done, anti-colonial scholarship within settler institutions like MIT? Uh, what, what's the, the way in which you mm, think about that, uh, encourage it, discourage it, um, map it in certain different kinds of ways? Um, I, and again, am I, I mean, we are, we're at MIT, we have people who would do the same exact research you would do, anthropologists as well, and people who would do a lot of very different kinds of research under the heading of anti-colonial scholarship, but it's all happening here. And what mm -hmm. does it have? Can it have credibility? Tyler, do you want to add anything to that before I take a stab uh, at it? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess the, the motivation was just thinking about us being in this space now and reflecting on my like past few months in grad school and how um, the, the rhetoric of decolonial decolonization and anti-colonialism are is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's in conferences and lectures and symposiums and syllabi. Um, it's all over the place. And I'm just wondering how you make sense of the uptake of the you know vernacular of decolonization and anti-colonialism um, within the academy and what this reflects um, within the settler state's need to constantly reproduce and reinscribe and re-legitimize its own authority. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. That's a great question. And I'm, I'm, um, I will say right off the bat that I approach it with deep skepticism and caution. <laughs> um, I um, have thought about this for a long time obviously as someone who's situated in the academy and feels a responsibility to be able to use the access that I have as a professor situated you know, in an institution with resources, with um, a particular kind of authority to um, leverage what I can from that institution into the world to support the political movements and the political commitments that I have that are longstanding um, and are long-term. <clears throat> So that being said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less certain that academic institutions like the new school, my institution, um, I'll just speak for that one, that are gonna, are gonna actually change at a fundamental structural level. I've learned a lot from my comrades in Canada who have been sitting in the sort of wave of indigenizing the academy and the lessons learned over the past kind of 10 years post Truth and Reconciliation Commission around how that has um, transformed, mostly not transformed institutions in Canada. So I think there are ways in which we can think about strategically utilizing the academy to advance particular kinds of political projects, draw resources, provide platforms, you know, but this is a question one has to ask themselves about their relationship to their institution, right? Are you committed to creating fundamental structural change in the institution that you work in? Do you believe that's even possible? I was on a panel with Kim Talbert um, a, 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 about a month ago, which was all about neoliberalism in the academy and whether or not it's even possible to create shifts in the ways that our academic institutions operate in this moment. Um, and I think also one of the things that I think about in, in terms of my role in the institution is also I'm an educator, right? I have a whole political pedagogy that is attached to, as do the professors who are teaching this class, right? Who are attached to a particular kind of knowledge production and dissemination that is also a political act, right? She, teaching in a particular way, accessing information in a particular way, um, shifting the ways that, you know, our canons um, have reproduced particular ways of knowing and understanding the world is also part of the work of being inside the academy. So I think you have to, pick, from my perspective, you have to pick and choose what you're willing to put time and energy into. But I also, my identity as an organizer is not solely tied to the academy, right? Because I, I inhabit many different spaces, my world is also, and the ideas and the commitments that I have 
are also formulated by many different kinds of spaces. I'm not disciplined by the academy in the same way I would be if I never spent time um, in community-based organizations, if I wasn't engaging in research with a particular kind of political orientation to methodology, if I wasn't working alongside frontline um, land and water defense movements, right? With a kind of political, long-term political commitment to goals and hanging out with organizers. And I think so part of this is like who you are and how you orient to an academic institution, right? And the possibilities you see for change within them or um, you know, if you have a more under commons kind of approach, I, you know, um, I'm in, but not of the institution and I'll draw whatever I can from it to leverage to a political project in the world, larger world. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for your instruction. Thanks for your candor. Um, we, I know we can't uh, hold you further. We will send you the, a copy of the, um, the chat because there's so many questions, like terribly sorry, we couldn't get to all of them in the time we had, but um, at least you should see the questions that were generated um, yeah. by the presentation. That would be great. And uh, um, if anyone has a question that I wasn't able to answer today and you wanna send me an email, you feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm happy to, to have a conversation outside of this um, and answer any of your questions I wasn't able to get to today. Thank you. That is so generous. And I have a hunch people will take you off on it. Um, again, um, thank you for being part of the class, for the instruction, um, for sharing the, your experience. And I hope we can stay in touch with you because we'd like to think we're an interesting data point in an institution mm -hmm. that has not until now made a move in this direction. And while we don't speak for the whole institution, we'd like for this um, effort, which we hope will continue um, to be connected to other similar efforts where, they, where learning can be shared independent of our home base institution, which there may not be a lot of other things here to and guide and share. So thanks again. Yeah, of yeah. course, my pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me and thanks to everyone for coming and sharing your comments and questions. Much appreciated, take good care. Asamu, uh, logistically, how do you want Yeah, to so just and before people hop off, thank you so much, Dr. Dillon. Um, we, I do wanna plug for all of our guests here, our, our event next week where we have two, two leading practitioners, um, one more focused on community planning with the Quinault Nation in Washington and, and one, Joseph Kunkel, who's uh, a really amazing designer and has been doing some work on um, tribal housing that's um, sustainable and resilient and um, culturally appropriate um, during, during COVID. And so I really hope if you're hungry for more ideas about what non-extractive work looks like, um, I think that will be a really fruitful session for you to join. Um, but thank you so much to our guest class. We are going to be jumping over to our regular Zoom line for the rest of this. Um, but if we could all just please applaud Dr. Dillon um, for her really amazing talk today. Yay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. I'll see everybody on the other line. Thanks, everyone. If you could send me the chat, that would be great. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Okay.